unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Our reading today is going to be taken from Ephesians, the second chapter and the eighth verse. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. By grace are ye saved through faith. And he says, and that is not of yourselves because it's grace. He says, it is the gift of God. Verses 9, it says, it's not of wax, least any man should boast. We're saved by grace through faith. So faith is the vehicle that gives or allows us to access grace. And that vehicle is not to be ignored. It's not to be taken lightly. Many people think that you can connect to grace without going through faith. It's not possible. It cannot be taken lightly. And in fact, I tell people in the New Testament dispensation, the only balance there is, is between grace and faith. There is no other balance there. It's not grace and laws. You cannot balance these two because the Bible says that the law is not of faith. Those two are actually opposites, okay? Because the law is of the works and abilities of men. The faith is of the work and the ability of God. For the Bible says it is God who works in us, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. But also, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. Okay? He's the one that begins this journey of faith, and he's the one that finishes it. Okay? Everything that you have done in the walk of faith has been an invitation in the revelation of God's love. And it is the working entirely of God as you lean in, as you submit to, as you align yourself by reading the word. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's simply to take God serious on his word. And he's able to avail all manner of grace for you to have the results, the answers that you need in this world. So when the Bible says that because this is not your own working, it is the free gift of God. Therefore, no man can boast about it. All right? The grace of God cannot be boasted over. All right? Because it's the free gift of God and it's not of our own works. But it is by the working of God that grace is given us. He sent his word. Without the word, we would not have faith. The whole beginning of this work is God from the beginning to the end of that. But how do we access grace through faith? It's the question. We access grace through faith by understanding the mind of God, the way of God, the way of the Spirit, the way God relates with us and the way God sees and perceives things. Unfortunately, today, we are living in a time where Christ is presented according to the ideas of men, right? We say, oh, this is divine inspiration. This scripture is divine inspiration. When really, it is the revelation of men toward God, okay? Even the canonization of scripture in the Bible, like we know it, is only as canonized as men felt led of the Spirit to do. But that's not entirely the full understanding and depth of God. God is deeper than what we have read, even in whatever is written, because what we have is just an account to help us guide us, to help us create boundaries in the liberty of the spirit that we have in God, that we might not go astray in the seeking of this God. Because when you go back in the Old Testament dispensation, where some of these liberties were not clear, you would find that many things were done, even by the patriarchs, that they were not intended but they were found to be so, okay? Abraham had a fear of God. Our father, Abraham, he had a fear of God. But there was a point in his life where when God spoke to him that through this woman, Sarah, he shall have a child, he did not know how that process was going to come. And what happens when Sarah sends him to his handmaid, he goes into the handmaid. Because in the liberties of God's grace granted him to have a child, he did not have the wisdom of the boundaries where we, God, was to function. Well, Moses was called to deliver the children of Israel from bondage. And that's true. 
But in the liberties of that calling, he did not know the way, the pattern of the doing of this thing. And what happens? At first, he has to kill an Egyptian and hide him in the sun, which was a mistake because God did not want to redeem Israel that way from the hand of Egypt. And that is why when he goes 40 years, okay, God deals with him. By the time he comes back anointed, given great instruction, he knows exactly what to do. But he could not wait upon the Lord because he did not know what boundaries were there in the seeking of the liberation of the children of God. And there's a danger when the boundaries are not clear. That's the essence of the canonization of Scripture. That is why certain books were set for us by our forefathers. There could have been many other, you know, writings about this Jesus, about the gospel. But some perhaps were not so reconciling. And for the fear that certain people exposed to these things might overstep the boundaries in the liberties of the Spirit. By the wisdom, and I believe by the leading of the Holy Spirit, these men were given the grace to put these things together for us in a book, which is the Bible, for you and I to read. But I again emphasize that this was their understanding of God, according to what God gave them, these writers in the Bible. And likewise also, the people that get this Bible for us together was their understanding and revelation in God according to what God gave them. But that doesn't mean that that is holistically God. God is bigger than what is written. Hallelujah. God is bigger than what is written. But to understand the way of the Spirit, to understand the way of God, is the beginning of a man's transformation. It's the beginning of interpreting the realities of truth that are perhaps even deeper than what you might read in one verse or two verses. But it's the collection of these things that later start to come to you. You start to understand these things by allegories, by shadows, by substances, by elements, by events, by affairs. And when these things are brought together, that is how we understand God. I believe, like the Bible says, in the last days knowledge shall be increased. We are living in that dispensation where knowledge is increasing every day. God hopes that the person listening to me now should or ought to know better than Elijah did. God hopes that the person listening to me right now ought to know better and cipher things better than Paul did. Why? Because the promise of the church in the New Testament is from one level of glory to another level of glory as we continue to grow because the body of Christ must grow to that full stature, the full measure of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The church is coming for is a church without spot nor wrinkle, nor any such thing. But the cleansing shall not be so much in the works than it is the ministration of faith as men are cleansed by the word. And that cleansing of the word implies that the place of revelation, you see, you might not understand this when your mind is so inclined to the law. Because every time your mind is inclined to the law, it means every time revelation comes to you, it's just there to help you live a morally upright life, and that's it. Okay? But when Jesus says, I'm come that you might have life and life to the fullest, have it abundantly until it overflows, it's more than just having a good morally upright life, which is a good thing. Okay? It's the right thing for a Christian life. Every Christian must live a morally upright life. But that's not the reason about the life of salvation. He said, you're going to heal the sick through this life. You're going to cast out devils through this life. You're going to raise the dead. You're going to cleanse the lepers. He says, you shall speak to that mountain. Be thou removed and be thrown in yonder place. And the Bible says, and that mountain shall move. So there is way more in this life than what meets the eye. It's through this that the salvation of souls is given. It's through this that the aligning of our ministry and divine purpose is given. It's through this that we live not only a glorious life, but the finite things in us connect to the infinite. This is the revelation that helps us understand that we are eternal. We're not only for this world. There's a lot you're doing right now, but has an effect on hundreds and hundreds of years to come. And you must understand that. That your ministry does not just end here. The things we are speaking, when we're long gone, if Christ is not yet back, somebody will dig out these steps. And they will need it for a great impartation to be aligned to the next dimension, next level of ministration. And we pray every other day in the name of Jesus Christ that the Lord so allow us that our message shall be relevant even in the time when men know better. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Say amen. So we see this mystery of faith. And we see that it's the vehicle that gives us grace. We are saved by grace through faith. Through faith. All right? And I want to help you understand this. Because when we're talking about grace, we're talking about the grace to stay morally upright. We're talking about the grace of wealth, the grace of divine health, 
the grace of peace, the grace of increase, the grace of multiplication, the grace of freedom, the grace of wisdom, every manner of grace that you know can be or is bestowed to every child of God, the Bible says, is through faith. Faith is the door. But you must understand how by faith we have access to this grace wherein we stand. The Bible says, wherein we stand. You must know how this works. You must understand the pattern. You must understand how the mind of the Spirit works through this. And the beginning of that, like I said, is to understand the mind of God. It's to understand the mind of the Spirit. How does God see? How does He perceive? How does He work in His workings in giving us faith and through that faith giving us grace? How does God see it? Let me read you something. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 20, it says, By faith... Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Now, I want you to watch this. He didn't say by faith, Isaac blessed Esau and Jacob concerning things to come. Because as all of us know the story, he did not bless them in their birth order. He didn't bless them in their birth order. He blessed them in the aligned order of the divine plan. Hallelujah. And so he says, by faith. So every event that goes in the life of Jacob and Esau, we want to understand where is the faith? How does this faith work in a man that was dim of vision? In a man who evidently was deceived? Okay? And I want to show you how this works. I want to show you how by faith, Jacob precedes Esau. So when the Bible says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. It says, by faith, there was an exchange of the older one serving the younger, of the younger one blessed in the place of the older one concerning things to come. And God tells us, in there is a mystery of faith. In there is a mystery of faith. The man of God, Isaac, is believing God that the right thing will be done, even though the scriptures tell us that he loved Esau. But he believes in his heart that the right thing is going to be done by faith. But this faith is not complete without the understanding of how it works even in his children, both Jacob and Esau, in the fulfillment of that ministry of faith. Because once you understand that, you will understand the grace that advances Jacob ahead of Esau. You'll understand it. Now, we need to go back. I need to build this story for you to understand it. In Genesis 25, verses 21, we see a story of the man of God, Isaac, and his wife was barren. So the Bible says in the 21st verse, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived, and the children struggled together within her. Okay? So when she conceives, two children in the womb start fighting with each other. And the Bible says in the 22nd verse, And she went to inquire of the Lord. Why am I like this? Why do I feel this struggle within me concerning two children? Like every mother should. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, two manner of people shall separate from thy bowels. Okay, there are two nations in you, and there are two kinds of people that shall be separated from their bowels. One womb, but two different nations. There's a revelation there. There's a very deep revelation there. One womb, but two different nations. Because it's not just enough to think that because you've been raised in the same womb of ministry, Therefore, you're going to come out the same way, even though the seed could be one. Okay? So it's possible, even for the most organized ministry, to produce an indifferent person. But that's for another day. The scriptures continue. The Lord says to her that in you are two nations in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. This is God speaking. The prophetic word has been spoken. Okay? Faith has been released because it cometh by the word. So when the word is released, that there are two nations, there is one people which shall be stronger than the other, and the elder one shall serve the younger, something has been appropriated in the spirit realm. Albeit the question is, how is this going to be fulfilled? And the Bible says in 24, And when her days were to be delivered or fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first one, came out red all over like a hairy garment and they called his name Esau and after that came out his brother his hand took hold of Esau's heel and his name was called Jacob and Isaac was three score years old when she bore them and the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter 
The Bible says he was a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. So you have two men here. One is a cunning hunter dwelling in the fields, a hard worker who deserves all the glory, who deserves all the praise, the reward, all the necessary stuff for grace to access, and indeed they do by works as well. But there's another fellow who is plain. And when the scripture says he was dwelling in tents, that scripture means he was a lazy fellow. But the lazy plain fellow is the one by God who has been prophesied upon, in whose life has been spoken that through this guy is the stronger nation going to be birthed and that his elder brother shall serve him. His elder brother shall serve him. I want you to follow me. His elder brother, Esau, shall submit or serve himself to this fellow. Now, because Esau was a hard worker, the Bible says that Isaac loved Esau. And he gives the reason of loving Esau. Not because he had seen anything scripturally aligning into this man's life. But the Bible says, but because he did eat of his venison. It was simple. Esau knew how to feed his father. And so Isaac loves Esau because Esau knew how to make venison. He knew how to cook a certain meal for him. And amazingly, that was the only reason why Isaac loves Esau more than Jacob. Because Jacob was not that a cook. If Jacob perhaps was a good cook, maybe there would be balances or even more. But you see that there was a carnal sense in the love that he had for Esau. And we don't judge our father for that. But we must understand that that was inconsequential. Because there's a reason why, for example, Rebecca loved Jacob. Why? Because when she's pregnant of these two children and she's seeking God, she had the message. God had spoken clearly to her that they shall be two nations. The stronger one shall be the younger one and the weaker one shall be the older one and the younger one shall be served by the elder. Okay? So she knew it. And so her connection to Jacob was spiritual because she had the mind of God concerning the destiny of her son. She knew it. So yes, Later, we start to see things that seem unfair, all right? We see Esau hungry one of those days, and he doesn't know what to do, and in not knowing what to do, he comes from the field ready to faint, and this fellow Jacob had cooked something, and then, you know, Esau tells him, you know what? I want some of that food, and says, uh-uh, on the exchange of a birthright, long and short, he says, for what profit is it to me for a birthright if I perish? And so he sold his birthright to his brother. Well... It's not fair. Why did he transact it for the birthright? But it also tells you just how Esau viewed the birthright. There was something in him that never understood what it means to come first. The pioneering spirit, the grace that will push you ahead of your peers, the grace that will put you many years ahead of the people that you went to school with or were raised with in the same home area, the grace that will work in your life to advance you ahead even of your own relatives and people has to be received with a certain wisdom. It has to be received with a certain wisdom. You must know how to earn and handle your right. Because it's not obvious that because you come first in line, therefore you shall be first in all things. Although it's the intended plan, but usually certain things and sometimes usually shift. Not only in family order, but even in school. Some of you, you will recall certain people that were the smartest guys in class. You know, they advanced well in their craft. They were the celebrated ones. I remember <laughs> some guys who even teachers used to take to their homes to eat different meals from the ones we ate because these guys were just so damn smart. When the teacher was away, this was the guy that would leave in class to discuss for you because it seems as though he doesn't just know the whole mind of the teacher. He even works the idiosyncrasy of the teacher. He talks like the teacher. He walks like the teacher. He acts like the teacher. Everybody wants to be like him. And then a couple of years later, as life would have it, you look at this fellow and something didn't change. Something got stuck somewhere. And the scales of life have not tilted well for him. And then you find him and you're like, but this guy was, yeah, yeah, he was. <laughs> but that's not what makes you fast. The Bible says the rest is not to the swift, neither the battle to the strong. It's not that because you are the fastest runner, therefore you will win that rest. No, he says, no, the battle is to the strong, neither bread to men which are wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, yet no favor to men of skill. But he says, yet time and chance happens to them all. You must know how to handle the grace that puts you fast. Because it's not about ranks, it's not about age, it's not about who came first, it's not about who the father loves most, it's about how you know how to churn your butter. It's about how you know how to access that oil. It's about how you know how to align yourself to the things of the Spirit in the wisdom of God. 
in the wisdom of God. So yes, Esau sells his birthright. But in selling that birthright, later on something happens. God is, with the help of Rebekah, going to align Jacob to the place of blessing. But how is he aligned in the place of blessing? I'll read us something here. The Bible tells us that at one point, Isaac tells Esau, go get me some venison, which I love you for. And when you bring it, I'll bless you. And then Rebecca overheard it. Then she calls her son, whom she loves, Jacob, whom God had spoken about. But somehow certain things have to take place in the physical realm to justify the word spoken of God. And uh, she tells him, you know, the blessing is coming on your brother. Yet I know by God that you're the one supposed to be up there. And it doesn't matter whether God spoke. If Isaac had not released that blessing himself, certain things would have changed and turned in the spirit realm. So even though God spoke, he still respects the order by which the blessing comes. The mature understand what I'm saying. He still respects the order by which the blessing comes. That's why you don't take for granted the laying on of hand by your spiritual authority. Okay? Now, the Bible tells us in Genesis 27, the 18th verse, so we see the first forward, Rebecca kills the animal, prepares the venison the way she knows Esau, prepares it because she's a woman, of course, she had studied the young man. She probably had taught him how, etc., etc. Anyway, we're at the point where um, Jacob approaches his father. And the Bible says, and he came unto his father and said, my father, which said, here am I, who art thou? And the father asks him, who are you, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau. Now, I want you to note that. I am Esau. Jacob comes in as Esau, thy firstborn. And he says, I have done according as thou hast uh, bedest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto him, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly? And he says, Because the Lord brought it for me. I mean, he's providing for this blessing. And Isaac says unto him, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be really Esau. Because he's starting to feel that this fellow might not be Esau. And the Bible says, And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy, as his brother's Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, uh, Thou art my very son, Esau. And he said, Yes, I am. Are you really my son, Esau? And he said, Yes, I am. Why? Because the voice was of Jacob, but the hands, the skin felt of Esau. The voice was of a man who was playing and dwelt in tents, but the hands, the working was of a man of the fields whose planting was blessed, who was due both for right and for the work that he had given in was due for that blessing. The scripture says, he tells him in 25, bring it near to me and I'll eat it, my son, that my soul may bless thee. He brought it near to him and he ate it. And his father said unto him, come now, kiss me, my son. He came and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Okay, so he's not only touching, but he wants to smell him. And remember, Rebecca had put skin on him to be hairy. Okay, and she's saying, no, if there's any judgment, if your father should discover, let that fall on me. Long and short, the man receives the blessing. I'm taking us somewhere. Follow me. So later on, of course, Esau comes. He's wrought in his heart. He's disturbed. He wants to die because they've taken his blessing. Is there no blessing for me? Oh, no, it is not. But a time shall come as you shall work and seek your God and do the things that must be done, that you shall break yourself from the yoke of this man. Of course, Jacob flees. Uh, because he cannot stand to be in the presence of a brother who wants to kill him. Years later, God creates an opportunity for this reconciliation. And when he presents an opportunity for this reconciliation, Jacob goes to meet Esau with gifts, you know, bearing gifts, and his children and his wives to introduce them because he wants to make peace with his brother. At that point, Esau is broken off from the bondage of his brother because he's richer, he has all his built nations. In fact, later the children of Israel, when they come from bondage, they have to dwell at Mount Seir, which was an inheritance of the Edomites. Edom meaning Esau, the children of Esau. So Esau made it, Esau made it. But here is the thing. That night before he meets his brother, he has to send his family ahead of him, his wives, and then he stays back alone in Genesis 32. And the Bible says, verses 24, he wrestled with a man until the breaking of day. Now, the Bible says, and when he saw that he had prevailed not, so a man comes and then starts to wrestle with him. They start fighting, all right? And the Bible says, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched 
the whole of his thigh and the whole of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So when the man wrestles with Jacob and Jacob is also striving and they're fighting with each other, he touches the hollow and immediately Jacob gives in because his thigh was out of joint. And he said to him, the man says to Jacob, which is God here, let me go for the daybreak. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. We saw the first blessing, you know, that gives him right above his brother and the blessing of his brother is upon him but now we're seeing another level of blessing here okay he says let me go for the daybreak and he said i will not let thee go except thou bless me and he said unto him what is thy name and jacob this time said my name is jacob all right and he said thy name shall be called no more jacob but israel for as a prince thou hast power with god and with men and hast prevailed and jacob asked him tell me i pray thee thy name and he said wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name and he blessed him there. And Jacob named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life has been preserved. Now, the name Israel means God prevails. Here is the mystery. To receive the blessing of the birthright, he could not go as Jacob, the supplanter, because Jacob means the supplanter, the trickster. When he's coming out from his mother's womb, he holds the heel of his brother. And so he's called the supplanter, the thief the trickster, to receive the blessing, he cannot come as Jacob. He has to come as the man that is qualified, the hunter of the field, who smells the field that is blessed of the Lord. So to access blessing from the Father for the birthright, he cannot say, I am Jacob. No, he comes in as Esau. All right? So he receives the blessing on the account of the man who has done good, of a man who has been aligned to the work, to the fellowship, to the commitment and the vision of whoever is most deserved to be rewarded. Mark this. When he comes in later for the second realm of his blessing, he wrestles with a man. And when he wrestles with a man, the man hits his hollow, his thigh is out of joint so he cannot fight. And he says, no, but I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asks him, what is your name? He says, my name is Jacob. He said, ah, 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 ah. from today, your name shall not be called Jacob, but thou shalt be called Israel, for God prevails. Okay? I need to change the name of the trickster, the thief, the funny fellow, before I bless you. You cannot be blessed in a fallen name. You cannot access the blessing. You cannot access grace through a fallen identity, through a fallen name. Okay? Right from the identity that he receives the birthright first from his father, he has to receive it in the name of Esau. When he comes to God again, when he's going to meet Esau, and he wrestles with the man, the man tells him, look, I will not bless you until I change this particular name. So he tells him from today, you're not Jacob, but you are Israel. Meaning God prevails and not the trickster or the thief. When the name is changed, the Bible says, and the man then blessed him. The man blessed him after the name changed. What is God trying to tell you and I? That when you come to me, I don't bless what comes to me in the mindset of a fallen nature. I don't bless that which comes to me in the mindset of an incomplete one. I don't bless that which comes to me in the mindset of insufficiency. I don't bless that which comes to me in the mindset of a shortfall. No, when you come to me, I wash you clean. I cleanse you by my blood. That when you come to me, you stand before me with confidence, knowing that you shall receive grace and mercy. That grace to help in time of need. Now, Jacob becomes Esau by faith. And the man he wrestles with changes Jacob's name also by faith. So we see that the mystery in the naming has, or identity spiritually, has a lot to do with how God responds in blessing a man. It's our spaces of faith. Oh, look at how people go to God in unbelief. You know, God, I'm a very bad man. But this is a believer praying. I don't deserve your goodness, oh God. But if you could help me, just give me something. So, I know you probably wanted to give me 100%, but with the things I've done, God, even me, I know I don't deserve it. Give me 20%. No, Jacob, you are called Israel. And if you don't take on that name, you cannot walk in the blessing. 
It's the communication of your faith becoming effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ Jesus. Some people are so awakened, even in the message, many ministers are so awakening on the weaknesses, on the insufficiencies of the low weights of men, and they think that that will substitute for wisdom in godly piety and humility. They think that that is humility, but that is false humility. Because when you become a child of God, somebody takes that place. Somebody takes that place. Like it was for the birthright. Esau takes the place of Jacob. So it is for the Christ in the birthright. Christ takes your place to receive all that is freely given in Christ. Like it is for the blessing when he's going to meet Esau. Okay? The man changes his name from the trickster and the thief to a man on whom God prevails over by grace. You see also Christ taking that space in giving us a new name because we believed on him. Because we believed on him. So, this faith that positions the younger above the elder, that quickens you, that speeds you up, that works in your life, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure, for grace to be availed for you, works this way. It works in you coming in the name of the one which is perfect. And never at any one point going to God to present your imperfections when you're a new creation. Because he knows them before you present them. He knows them before you present them. True repentance is not just sorry. There is a sorrow that is not godly. The Bible speaks of ungodly sorrow. But the Bible also speaks of godly sorrow. The godly sorrow, the repentance which is godly, is hemmed on God's revelation on what true repentance is. Because the Greek word there is metanoia, right? The changing of the mind from what I was to what I am. If you were a thief, if you know that you were a thief, or you've done certain things that thieves do, okay? The changing of your mind to say, I am not a thief, that's the beginning of your repentance. But that's not what takes away sin. No. Sin is taken away by the shedding of blood. For the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's no remission of sin. There are many people who can repent of all they want in the world, but if they have not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they still carry the eternal sin because of their fallen nature in the Adamic. Hello. So righteousness imputed by faith means that this is the mindset that you are supposed to have even when you go before God, even in your most fallen state. It doesn't mean that you don't know or see or recognize that there are weaknesses in you that need their own doing. But when you go to God, go to God to present what he knows about you, revealed and done, experienced and demonstrated in the person of Jesus Christ. When you do that, then you're working in faith because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's how we go. We don't go as poor hugs, no. We go as children of God, even in our most fallen nature. We approach his throne as children of God. Nobody gets to the Father except by Jesus. Why is it that we use the name of Jesus Christ? The name of Jesus Christ to us is as the name of Esau, to Jacob. Not that we can ever do anything perfect. Not that we can ever be sufficient enough. Not that we can ever do the best stuff there is in the world to earn God's grace and favor. But he says, but if you understand how to come to me, you shall receive grace. If you understand how to work your faith out as you come to me. Because when you come to me, you should not consider your own works. You shouldn't consider your own works. When Hezekiah was sick, and the prophet tells him, put your house in order for you're going to die. Hezekiah said, okay, God, you remember what I've done, and this and that and that. And God added him more years. This is not the dispensation that pleads healing because of what it has done and it has not done. This is the dispensation that pleads the healing of God because of what Christ has done at the cross. Whether you did good or didn't, he was still wounded for your transgressions. Whether you were right or not, he was still bruised for your iniquities and the chastisement of your peace was upon him and by his stripes ye were healed anyway. Because you live in a dispensation where all has been done and given through Christ. I wish somebody understands what I'm saying. So, when he's calling you to the throne of God, he says, come boldly. Come boldly. 
to the throne of grace. Don't come scared, oh, you know, I did this, oh, I stole this guy's birthright, oh, when I come to God, he'll not accept me because I stole this birthright, oh, no, you know, my wives first go ahead, my children, like Jacob did, he first go ahead of me, oh, because he had a certain identity, a certain naming on his life. All the promises of God are toward Israel, not Jacob. Every promise he will do good to Israel. No weapon forms against children of Israel shall prosper. Everything is on Israel. The blessing is on the man whom God calls what he is not against all odds because it's the only way the blessing can connect itself to this man. There is no other way grace is accessed except through faith. And then he says, it's not of your works. I don't go to God. I'm not guaranteed because of what I'm going to do tomorrow. It doesn't mean that I don't want to live a good life, a right life. In fact, the gift of righteousness fosters right living in my life because that is the way the testimony of God is underguarded. So I believe in right living, not only just right believing, but in right living, living right, morally upright, loving, walking in love, forgiving, and all these things that the law of the Lord requires of us. However, those are not the things that qualify me for grace. <laughs> No, my qualification of grace is in the person of Jesus Christ. For while you were yet seen, as the Bible says, Christ died. While you were a plain man dwelling in tents, lazy, without having hunted any game, God still required to give you the blessing with a game you did not make, with a venison you did not cook. That is what Jesus Christ came to do. He became the propitiation of your sins. He became the substitute for us so that when we go to god we go with boldness to the throne you don't go timid you go with boldness to the throne you go convinced and secured in what god has done through the person of jesus christ and he says you only come in that boldness that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need because in this realm it has to be found the grace to help in time of need has to be found so the seeking here is in the understanding of the boldness in which we come. And no boldness can come saved by faith. When we consider the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. He is the God that calleth the things which are not as though they are. The God that knoweth the end from the beginning. So he aligns us in that way. That is his mindset. He says you cannot connect to grace when you don't see that way. You cannot walk in the mind of the mystery of grace when you don't see that way. And there's no shortcut to that. There's no other way to that. That is the only way. So you either choose to walk that way, or you choose to always go on your works and disqualify yourself when you're not fully fulfilling all that is required of the law. And then you judge yourself and justify and unjustify yourself and then feel that you don't deserve certain things. Because you did this and then you did that. And then people start, you know, there are also men of God who are like that. They rub it in, in the faces of people and they always do that. But they forget that all of us have been saved by grace through faith and not of our own works. Least any should boast. Least any should boast. We all need grace. We need the grace of provision. We need the grace of divine health. We need the grace of peace, the grace of love, the grace of increase, the grace of multiplication, the grace of settled families. We need the grace of restoration. But we all have this through faith and not of our own works. Somebody was seeking prayer from me, but when they came to seek prayer, they sort of were justifying the reason why they were sick. To make me understand that the disease they were suffering from was not their own doing because they had this thought that if it was of their own doing, they had less chances of healing. And that's the problem with Christianity because they think that the blessing of God has to do with what man has done or has not done. No. The blessing of God is entirely pegged on what God has done through Christ. Whether you were guilty for it or not, it doesn't matter. Grace to help in time of need is found 
when we come boldly through faith. Because faith is no respecter of persons. Faith does not explain how. Faith does not consider histories. Now faith is. Faith begins from where you're ready to take God seriously from. So I see that in this person's mentality is the mentality of many who think that they don't deserve certain things because they believe that the situations they're in are the consequences of their own doing and so they deserve that judgment. And also another group of people who think that they deserve a certain way of treatment with God because they have been so good and so what. And that is why the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that we have seen how the wicked have learned to prolong their own days and the righteous perish early in the same. Because it's not about what you do. It's about what God has done through Christ Jesus. Jesus became all. He paid it all for you and I. That's what you believe. That's how you should live. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now I want you to open your voice. Lift up your hands wherever you are and thank God for the word that you've received today. And I want you to plug into faith this very moment. This few minutes, something mighty is about to happen. I just want you to plug into faith. Plug into faith and start to pray. Plug into faith and start to pray. Lift your voice and start to speak to God about this. Speak to God about this. Speak to God about this. Tell him, God, I thank you for the faith that I have. And that faith that is given by the reading and the reading of the word of God. And that grace that I have by Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you. Because by that faith, I receive grace for provision. I receive grace for divine health. I receive grace for restoration. I receive grace for multiplication. I receive grace for glory. I receive grace for the demonstration of your power. I receive grace for growth. I receive grace for peace. I receive grace for joy. I receive grace for strength. I move out in your strength. I walk in your strength. I walk in your love. I walk in your mercies. I walk in your providence. I walk in the vision that you have for the church. And every other day as your word comes, it cleanses me. It washes me. And I'm without spot nor wrinkle. Because you have imputed righteousness on me and not sin. And because you have, I see myself so. As the righteous of God. As a saint of God. As a child of God. And not a sinner. Because I'm born not of flesh and blood. Nor the will of man but by the spirit. And that which is born of God cannot, does not habitually, deliberately commit sin. For your divine spam permanently abides in me. Your nature is in my life. I'm more than a conqueror by Christ which strengthens me. I receive grace to overcome that weakness. I receive grace to overcome that bondage. I receive grace to overcome that trial. I receive grace to overcome that addiction, that perversion, that anger. Those of you who have anger, whatever you've been dealing with, say I receive grace to walk free, to walk in the righteousness that has been imputed on me by Christ. I choose not to look at my own works and ability for nothing in me can satisfy God fully to earn the blessing that I so need for my hour. But I keen and lean on Christ's work at the cross who was perfect, who knew no sin and became sin that me being dead and two sins might live unto righteousness. That is the man by whom I stand. That is the name in which I come. You say that no man shall get to him except through him. He is the way, the truth, and life. And he is our mediator. The Bible calls him the mediator of the new covenant. Whose blood speaketh better things than the blood of Abel which speaks judgment. The blood of Abel which speaks vengeance. The blood of Abel which speaks hatred. The blood 
blood of Abel which speaks retribution and revenge. I receive the blood which speaketh love. I receive the blood which speaketh life. I receive the blood which speaketh hope. I receive the blood which speaketh restoration. I receive the blood which speaketh pardon. I receive the blood which speaketh wisdom. I receive the blood which speaketh glory. I receive the blood which speaketh multiplication. I plead that blood which speaketh upward and upward, forward and forward and I decree and I declare that your houses are blessed. Your homes are blessed. Your ministries are blessed. Your businesses are blessed. Your marriages are blessed. Your children are blessed. You are healthy. Divine health is yours from your head to your toe. In the mighty name of Jesus and you're plugging there by faith and God says you receive grace for whatsoever you ask in Jesus mighty name we have prayed and believed and all saints said amen if you're there and you're not born again unfortunately these promises are not for you but they can be for you because God wants to connect his life with you. He wants to give you hope. He wants to give you life eternal. He does not want you to perish with the wicked. And the Bible says that whosoever believes on the name, whoever calls on the name of Jesus, they shall be saved. And so I want to give you an opportunity to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word for your story for your blessing because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory tonight I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior I'm born again the message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at live stream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.